All right, a uh, couple of travel notes. Um, the Secretary General tomorrow will take part in a ceremony in Lisbon to kick off that city's designation as European Green Capital. The title awarded by the European Commission aims to honor cities that are leading the way towards environmentally friendly urban living. The ceremony will also mark the beginning of a decade of climate action to achieve the goal set by the Paris Agreement. Another event linked to Lisbon designation is 2020 European Green Capital. The Secretary General will attend the inauguration of an interactive installation titled One and taking place at the Lisbon Oceanarium. It is worth noting that the 2020 UN uh, Ocean Conference will also be held in Lisbon in early June. The President and the Prime Minister of Portugal, the Mayor of Lisbon, and the European Commissioner for Environment, Oceans and Fisheries, and the Vice President of the European Commission and others will also take part in the events. Then on Monday, January 13th, the Secretary General will travel to Pau in France to attend a working dinner hosted by President Emmanuel Macron and take part as part of a summit with the leaders of Burkina Faso, Chad, Mali, Mauritania, and Niger, otherwise known as the G5 Sahel countries. Joseph Borrell of the European Union, Charles Michel of the European Council, the African Union's Moussa Faki, and Louise uh, Mushi Kiwabo from the International Organization of the Francophonie are also expected to attend the dinner. Uh, the dinner aims to address the crisis in the Sahel by strengthening international engagement and collaboration on security, humanitarian, and development issues. The Secretary General will be back in New York on Tuesday. Rosemary DiCarlo, the Under Secretary General for Political and Peacebuilding Affairs, will arrive in Dakar in Senegal on Sunday, ahead of a week-long visit that will take her to not only Senegal, but also Guinea-Bissau, Niger, Nigeria, and Burkina Faso. In meetings with national and regional leaders, uh, Ms. DiCarlo will discuss the security, political, and humanitarian situation in the region and explore ways on how the UN can enhance its support to tackle challenges to peace, security, and stability, including the fight against terrorism. Um, the, on, ten years ago, on Sunday at uh, 4.53, uh, about 35 seconds of violent terror changed the face of Haiti. In a video message released uh, today, the Secretary General paid tribute to the hundreds of thousands of Haitians who lost their lives and to the millions more who lost their homes, family members, and so much more in the devastating earthquake. He also honored the memories of 102 UN colleagues who lost their lives that day and renewed the UN's commitment to help Haiti and its people build a brighter future. In Port-au-Prince on Sunday, all UN staff have been invited to attend a commemorative ceremony to be held at the site of the Christopher Hotel, which, as you will recall, was the uh, hotel that housed the UN peacekeeping mission's headquarters, and that hotel collapsed during the earthquake. Assistant Secretary General Miroslav Yencha will be the senior official from New York representing the UN at the ceremony and other commemorative events organized by the Haitian government. Next week, there'll be another event to mark the anniversary, uh, a number of other events. On Monday in Tunis, the UN will inaugurate the Hedi Anabi Hall, honoring the memory of the head of the UN peacekeeping mission, Hedi Anabi, who was killed, uh, who died during the collapse of the Christopher Hotel. As you will recall, Mr. Anabi was also a longtime Assistant Secretary General for peacekeeping uh, operations here in New York. And in Geneva on Wednesday, there'll be another commemoration of the Palais des Nations with, among other participants, Haiti's Minister of Foreign Affairs. And lastly, on Friday next week, on January 17th, the Secretary General will take part in a ceremony uh, here, which will include representatives of the countries who lost their lives uh, during uh, the earthquake. Uh, those wishing to pay their respects will also be able to visit the memorial relocated from Haiti where to the North Lawn to honor the memory of all of our colleagues who died that day 10 years ago. Um, Back here, uh, the Security Council, as you know, is continuing its uh, ongoing meeting on upholding the Charter, which began yesterday. Uh, there were 56 speakers inscribed for today's discussion at the start of the morning. Meanwhile, we do expect uh, the Security Council to consider the reauthorization of the uh, cross-border crossings for humanitarian aid into Syria uh, at a meeting later this afternoon. 
Turning to Libya, uh, I want to state that we are deeply concerned by the deaths of two more health workers yesterday who were killed during the shelling in al Washka, about 137 kilometers west of the city of Sirt. Five support staff were also injured in the incident. In 2019, at least 61 attacks impacting field hospitals, healthcare workers, ambulances, and medical supplies were recorded. At least 75 people were killed in those incidents and 52 others injured. Humanitarians continue to call on all parties to abide by their obligations under international humanitarian law to protect civilians and civilian infrastructure. Medical facilities, medical personnel, and medical transport must be respected and protected at all times. Turning to the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, where a new UN report says that killings, rapes, and other forms of violence targeting the Hema community in the Ituri province uh, may amount to crimes against humanity. The report, which is a result of an investigation conducted by the Joint Human, Human Rights Office in the country, says that the Lendu armed groups have become more organized to carry out attacks, and that one of their objectives is to take control of the land and associated resources of the Hema communities. Between, 20, uh, between December of 2017 and September of last year, at least 700 people have been killed, 168 injured during inter-ethnic clashes between the Hema and Lendu communities. At least 142 people were subjected to sexual violence. Acts of reprisals of the Hema communities against the Lendus were also documented. The report urges the authorities to conduct an independent and impartial investigation to the violence and to ensure, ensure the rights of reparations for victims as well as access to medical and psychosocial care. And uh, on Ethiopia, our humanitarian colleagues tell us that due to climate and man-made crises, some 8.4 million people are in need of assistance. Uh, that's according to a new report put together by the UN and, part and other partners in consultation with the Ethiopian government. Most of the people in need are in the Oromia, Somali, and Amhara regions of Ethiopia. The 2020 Humanitarian Response Plan for Ethiopia is currently being finalized and will be shared with you when we can. A couple of other notes related to the UN Refugee Agency. Uh, the agency today welcomed El Salvador's new law that will help protect internally displaced people. The legislation opens the doors for tens of thousands of victims of forced displacement in the country to gain access to life-saving humanitarian assistance and to have their basic rights restored, including effective, to ac effect, including effective access to justice. The law further provides for the establishment of a comprehensive national system that brings together a wide range of state institutions to collaborate in response to and preventing forced displacement. The text of the legislation was drafted with technical support from UNHCR and aligns with UN's guiding principles on internal displacement. And lastly, we congratulate UNHCR because today they were awarded the Olympic Cup by the International Olympic Committee for, the, for their work in supporting refugees and host communities through sport. In accepting the award, High Commissioner Grandi said that the award is a tribute to the displaced people and communities that UNHCR serves, who understand the transformative power of sport and have seized the opportunities that have been offered to them. Um, the IOC, as you may recall, has, 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 excuse me, has established a second IOC refugee Olympic team to take part in the Summer Games in 2020. Lastly, let's talk about money. Um, so good, we're going to credit them twice. On January 3rd, while many of us were on leave, Fahan spoke about the first three member states that paid full contributions to 2020's regular budget. Uh, with a fourth country paying up today, we're going to repeat our thanks to Armenia, Portugal, and Ukraine, and freshly thank India, which paid up today. So far, we have uh, how many member states we have fully paid up? Four. You know, don't put your, I, I'm going to tell you what I tell my son. Put your phone down and pay attention. Um, so that's okay. I don't, just stop. Uh, so the number, of, um, we close out 2019 with 146 member states having paid their dues in full uh, for the 2019 budget. And as of yesterday, 10 member states were in arrears and fall under the provisions of Article uh, 19, and that's Central African Republic, Comoros, Gambia, Lebanon, Lesotho, Sao Tome and Principe, Somalia, Tonga, Venezuela, and Yemen. Um, in the fall, in October of last year, the GA had decided that three of those, Comoros, Sao Tome and Principe, and Somalia, shall be permitted to vote in the General Assembly until the end of the 74th session. Halas.
Nabil. So we expect uh, uh, a meeting on uh, the cross-border mechanism this afternoon. Um, can you tell us what's the immediate and direct impact on the ground if the council fails again today to adopt a resolution? Well, um, the uh, first of all, we don't want to speculate, right? We very much hope uh, that the members of the council will come together in agreement and um, permit us to continue our work during cross during cross border operations. I think, as I said, uh, as I said yesterday, we have no alternative to reach the people in the northwest and northeast than through cross border operations. So if there is no resolution uh, rollover, uh, the operations will cease by, by the end of today. Yes. Follow-up, Steph. Uh, can you tell us how many people will be affected if the resolution fails to pass? Well, the, 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 the millions of people that, uh, that we reach, uh, civilians that we are, are trying to reach through these, through these operations. Can you give us an exact number? Well, I, you know, I'd have to tabulate all the people that we've uh, reached. I can try to do that, but I, uh, it's, it's, obviously, uh, it's obviously in the millions in terms of the people that we've been able to, to reach since uh, we were permitted to run these cross-border operations. Uh, Maria, and then Mr. Bays. Uh, thank you, Stefan. Um, so um, it seems that uh, countries uh, put uh, for vote two resolutions which remain almost uh, unchanged. Uh, during this time, since first voting, did the Secretary General try to interfere in negotiations to try to bring parties closer well, to the, agreement? Let's be clear. Uh, The work on a resolution is the domain of the members of the Security Council, right? They are the ones who are negotiating. That being said, uh, the Secretary General over the past week and before has spent a lot of time on the phone uh, with various members of the Security Council um, expressing uh, his own views, which is uh, basically what I've been telling you, is the, 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 the critical need for us to continue to cross-border uh, operations. And by phone, you mean, uh, you mean he was contacting capitals? No, he was, I mean, there were some capitals, so there was a lot of discussions, either in person or by phone with uh, permanent representatives uh, here as well. He has been, uh, he and, and other uh, senior UN officials have stayed in close touch uh, with members of the Security Council on this issue. Mr. Bays. What is the view of OCHA and the humanitarian community? Would it be better to have three border crossings or two border crossings? Uh, um, in as much as you would like me to get involved in the negotiations and negotiate from here, I will not. What is vital for us is for these cross-border operations to continue. We will see what comes out of the Security Council today. Okay, we'll ask the question another way. Which would deliver more aid, three border crossings or two border crossings? Thank you. Uh, yes. Um, on Haiti, uh, you noted the various events marking the anniversary of the tragic earthquake. Uh, but there was another tragedy, as you know, in Haiti caused by UN peacekeepers, and that's the cholera break, uh, you know, the breakout uh, of the cholera epidemic and uh, many deaths that followed. What is the current status of the uh, UN's pledges to uh, make restitution uh, to uh, the communities affected and, and the uh, families and individuals uh, affected by the cholera outbreak? Well, is you... Uh as you know, uh, we have been uh, extremely involved in the continuing fight uh, against cholera. And since the outbreak of cholera in October 2010, the international community has been spent about $705 million uh, to fight cholera in support of the Haitian government's own uh, national plan. Um, that includes at least $64 million raised uh, and mobilized by UN agencies. Um, the latest numbers I have really date back from December for nearly uh, 11 
consecutive months as of, I think, around December 20th, there were no positive tests for cholera that had been reported. Uh, there has been a consistent downward trend in, um, in downward trend in, chol in number of cholera cases uh, since late 2016, 2017, and 2018, and uh, 2019. I mean, just in the last week of December, I think there were five cholera tests uh, in Haiti, all turned out to be uh, to be negative, and that's. So that's down from a peak uh, wherever there were some 18,000 cases uh, a week. So in a sense, there's been, there's been an extremely positive trend in downward trend in the number of cholera cases, and that is thanks to the, uh, the mobilization of the, uh, of the international community. Um, we still need about $20 million uh, to finalize uh, the cholera response plan through the through 2022, and to try to maintain a zero transmission uh, for three uh, for the we we need a three year um, zero uh, benchmark to to be for the WHO to declare uh, Haiti cholera uh, free. There is, as you know, track two, uh, which the UN is working with communities that were most impacted by cholera to empower them to identify and implement projects that are most meaningful to them. Uh, the UN has expanded its community-led consultative process to about 25 communities throughout Haiti. Uh, that, that work is continuing to be led by uh, Josette Chirin, uh, who continues to be very focused on it. What about the uh, individuals or families who were directly impacted by That's the That's done through, uh, through track two, which is working with those, uh, those communities. And how much money can you tell us about? How much money? No, I don't have expanded? the, let me just see if I have the track two. Uh, Numbers. I don't have them in front of me, but uh, unfortunately, we've not been able to mobilize as much as we'd like on track on track two. But I think it is very important to underscore the work that has been done uh, with the leadership of the Haitian government in getting to that almost zero case uh, number of cholera cases. Fatih, and then Stefano. Thank you, Steph. Uh, Positively, there is a, a movement in the track on, on the Sahel uh, region uh, from the uh, Secretary General and the uh, USG de Carlo that she is uh, going to be in the region. Is there any uh, ideas that the Secretary General is going to bring out uh, to try to uh, bring change in this region to the UN operations? Uh, I know that there is a dinner uh, with the leaders uh, in France. Uh, this week or next week, what the Secretary General have to bring to the to the to the region in terms of the UN I mean, operations there, there, that have there, there been are, questions you know, about its validity or continuing? Well, I mean, its validity. Uh, you know, I think we addressed this quite in uh, at length uh, yesterday. I mean, the the UN mission in Mali is focused; its mandate is to focus on Mali. It is not a counter terrorism uh, operation that is not its mandate. Uh, it is there to support the government of Mali, support the people of Mali. It has been on the, borne the brunt, a uh, huge number of, uh, of casualties. Um, there is the G5 Sahel force, which, for which the Secretary General has been consistently pushing now uh, for them to receive a predictable and consistent funding, so they're able to do their work uh, effectively. And there's also the need on the development side uh, to deal with a lot of the root uh, the root causes of uh, of what is going on in the Sahel. So the Secretary General will uh, is looking forward to meeting with the leaders uh, in Poe to try to increase the co not only the the cooperation and coordination, but also to increase the support from the international community to those countries that are on the front lines. Stefano and then James. Then Thank you, Stefan. Um, sorry, I arrived two minutes later, so I don't know if you say it in your introduction. I missed, you missed a lot in the first two minutes. Uh, probably. Um, even, <laughs> even the call for a ceasefire by <laughs> President Erdogan and Putin uh, didn't work because uh, in Libya the fight continues and uh, actually General Haftar rejected the, the ceasefire. So what is the reaction of the Secretary General when it looks like uh, nothing works, even the, the call from, from Russia and Turkey didn't work? The, the reaction uh, from the UN and the efforts led by uh, Mr. Salami will be to continue 
and to redouble their efforts to work on a on a political solution. But I think Mr. Salame's call uh, to all of you know that he made publicly in front of all of you last week, which is basically to ask member states to support the Lib people of Libya, but to leave Libya alone, in a sense, that Libya does not need more guns, does not need more interventions, does not need more missiles or drones, um, remains valid as it is uh, today. And we will continue uh, We will continue our political efforts. Just a quick follow-up. Does the UN has a plan on eventual fall of Tripoli if this happens in the next... Look, I, I'm not going to start to speculate uh, on the fall of Tripoli or anything else. We always have a contingency uh, plans, but the message is that there is no military solution to what is going on in Libya now. I mean, and, and every day from here, I feel we're underscoring the suffering of the Libyan people. Just today, they're targeting, uh, the targeting of medical workers. James. Um, so it's another question on the Sahel summit. Mm -hmm which I know you spoke about earlier and you spoke about yesterday, and you said yesterday that the SG has been raising this mm -hmm. since the beginning of his term, since 2017. Clearly, since then, the situation has got worse. The violence has expanded, particularly in the last year, Burkina Faso. So tell us, as these leaders come to meet at this summit, how critical, how serious are things now? They're extremely critical. I mean, every day uh, we see increased uh, attacks by, uh, by terrorist elements, by insurgents. Uh, and again, uh, the people, the civilians, are paying, are paying the price. Um, it's a, a crisis that is somewhat underreported, in a sense, uh, because of the difficulties, uh, difficulties of access. Um, but it is a situation that is deteriorating across the region. Yes, Errol. Steph, thank you. Um, it seems to be that every single country of the United Nations membership would like to uh, address the uh, issue of upholding of the uh, UN Charter. So far, I'm sure the Secret Secretary General is uh, following as much as he can. What is his conclusion, what he wants to add or to, to say probably, although knowing his known sentiment of non uh, resentment, I mean... Well, I, mean I, I think he, he delivered his own message at yeah, the but, start, but, but at the start of the meeting. Listening others. I, listen, it is good to hear that every member state believes in upholding uh, the charter. Uh, it would be fantastic if uh, we would see renewed unity and support for, multi, uh, for multilateralism. Yes, yep. We, we are going to uh, remember probably the 15 years ago, uh, yes, 15 years ago in, on World Summit in September 2005, R2P was developed out of the... Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so far, how the Secretary General see that? With the, is it R2P, is it alive at all? Uh, could be applied? And what can he say about that? Well... Listen, I, I, I don't have a, a quick analysis for you on, on the Secretary General's current view on, on R2P. Uh, what is easy to note in when we talk about what is going on in Syria, in Iraq, in uh, Libya, throughout the Sahel. In Libya. It, yeah, that's what I just said, in Libya, uh, across the Sahel, um, is that it is people, it is ordinary civilians, it is men, women, and children who are bearing the front of the suffering and the fighting. Uh, yes, go, uh, go, go ahead, in the back, and then, uh, yeah, and then Beitul. Um, this is regarding Iraq. Uh, I'm reading reports that the Iraqi Foreign Ministry has submitted a letter to the Security Council uh, complaining that uh, Iran has violated its uh, territorial sovereignty with the missile attacks. I was wondering if you could... Yes, there was a letter, that. I think, that was... Uh, and it's been a long week. Uh, there's a letter that was received earlier this week uh, that has been circulated to members of the Security Council. Bitu. Steph, you might have mentioned, uh, maybe I missed it, there was a phone conversation between the SG and the U.S. Secretary mm -hmm. of State, Mike Pompeo. Can you tell us what was discussed? And also on the Ukrainian plan plane crash, I know the U.N. has nothing to do with that, but three countries, Canada, the U.S., and the U.K., 
uh, said that they had evidence that the plane was uh, hit by an Iranian missile. The New York Times reported that they obtained a video which shows that it was hit by the Iranian missile. Would the SG call for an independent investigation? No, I, I think there are there are procedures uh, in place uh, that are established by the International Civil Aviation Organization. Uh, I think they put out a statement yesterday that they'd received notific official notification from Iran that uh, the investigation was on uh, going. So we, I think we all look forward uh, to the results of the investigation as it is, um, uh, as, as it is established through procedures that have been used many times and you know we, we can only uh, we saw the, the press reports uh, I think coming out of Tehran that uh, other uh, countries notably uh, France and the United States uh, and Canada would be welcome to work with the Iranians on the investigation and that's obviously something to be welcomed what's the latest for uh, Yemen uh, yeah. I don't have an update for you from Yemen. I'll no, no. try to get something to you soon. Yes. Uh, reports in recent hours of two Iraqi journalists being assassinated in Basra. What's the response of uh, that? I will take a look. If they, uh, if they turn out to be true, they are to be uh, condemned. We have seen journalists uh, throughout the world, but especially in the region, uh, being killed or, in, or imprisoned uh, in an effort to silence them, which is unacceptable. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Friday? Yes? It's Friday? Can somebody confirm that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm here Monday. Yeah, if you don't see me by 12.05, uh, come and get me. <laughs>